quick introduction. Uh, my name is Patrick Finn. Um, a joint twist by science um, this morning, so this is a pretty interesting baptism of fire. Um, of interest, Emily can't be here, she's on her way to Washington DC, and for some unknown reason, she chose the, sick, the second thickest accent in the company to make some introductions. So, if anybody needs a translator, I heard a couple other British accents in the crowd. Uh, yeah, both sides. So, really happy to introduce Mike here. Um, you know, so sort of looking at some of the things that really attracted me to Twist as a company, what it's going to be very capable of doing in the biology, or the biological community. I, I really like the idea of the sort of design build test. Really? That's a first. I've never been told to speak up before. Okay. So I really like the idea of the design build test. And I think at Twist, I think we, we hope to do as well in the build as Selgin's doing it in the design. I think really, some really interesting tools. I think there's a lot of synergies between what we're doing. My apologies for reading from the list here. It's quite an impressive uh, background. So, yep. So, yeah, before launching or finding, actually, co founding, yeah, Selogen, like an NIH quantitative research career fellow and principal investigator at Stanford, studying the role of protein localization, essential genomic elements needed for bacterial life. While at Stanford, he worked with Pat Brown and David Botstein, leading to develop the first genome human DNA microarrays, which have been really fantastic research. Before Stanford, Mike was VP of Software Engineering at Neomorphic, a computational genomics company which you think of was acquired by AFI, which again was obviously something of great value there. And a role as a consultant with Hyperparallel, a big data analytics company acquired by Yahoo. Going back into Mike's education, the list is incredibly long of great achievements, and I'll leave out a mere 40 publications. And uh, I think with that very brief introduction, I'll get out of the way and leave it to you, Mike. Thank you.
the department of energy and their mission is next sort of next next generation biofuels and biochemicals right so you know not taking food out of someone's mouth in order to make ethanol but trying to go to something that's much more sustainable much more direct conversion of solar energy into a very useful chemical and I like, try to explain to people, it's like, oh, we'll just take solar power and convert it to you know, electricity in our car. That's good. That's a part of the mix. But there are, there's a huge bolus of energy that we use that has to be in that concentrated liquid form. And that was the mission, of, that is the mission of the Joint Power Energy Institute, to find alternatives to make them much more efficient. Um, so we can remind ourselves, you know, uh, what a barrel of oil goes to, and it's largely fuel. So it's tough. It's tough. This stuff is really cheap. But where can we make inroads? We can make inroads on the parts, slice of the barrel of oil that is high value. The stuff that goes into uh, products like the one I'm going to talk about today for flavors and fragrances, which is like a $25 billion a year industry. So even though they're small fractions of the barrel of oil, these are big industries with you know, lots, of, lots of actual product being produced. Um, the example I want to use today <coughs> is um, adibic acid. So a lot of you guys, since this is metabolic engineering and bioinformatics, you guys know about adipate and adibic acid. It's a well sort of worn example, but it's kind of, it's still a good one. And, and it's a kind of a fun one to demonstrate. Uh, you can reprogram yeast or E. coli to take in foreign genes and produce in abundance a chemical that normally is produced in just tiny little amounts as a metabolic process in a, in a you know, in a, metabolic cycle. But you can rejigger the, uh, the pathways of these organisms to produce a lot of this stuff. And several companies are doing that, like Verzyme and, and Genematica and others. It's kind of a fun example to use. The, um, the bio-based part is adipic acid. So that's that's the part we're, gonna, we're going to concentrate on here today. Um, to show you why this is so fun, it's because Nylon 6.6 demo, for people who you know remember their chemistry, is always a fun demo to make to do, and I'm going to show how to make nylon out of adipic acid, which is something that comes out of a bacteria, and another chemical called hex, hex, hexamine diamine, which is, is uh, uh, not bio-based. But let's see if we can hear this. OK, wait a minute. Let's try it. And I'm supposed to put in, I'm supposed to put in this thing. Okay, so we shot this at Twist a couple of days ago. All right, so you're going to get some white noise from the fans in the laboratory. I, I have a bullet mic, but I forgot to put it on my camcorder. So you're going to hear some white noise. Just bear with it. If it's too much, I'll just narrate it for you. So here we go. Let's make nylon 6-6. Six -six. Still can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> My narration's not that. Why don't we just go in the back? Okay, we're going to reenact. Do both voices. We do both voices. Underground laboratory of Twist Bias. Not underground. Right. We're not underground. We're above ground, actually. But, but what we're going to do is we're going to see a really cool reaction, a polymerization reaction, a condensation reaction. Um, it's extremely dangerous and highly flammable. These are chemicals, if they're mixed incorrectly, they, you could just blow up. reaction, condensation reaction. Um, it's extremely dangerous and highly flammable. These are chemicals, if they're mixed incorrectly, they, you could just blow up. Uh, 
perfect, perfectly safe, perfectly safe. Kids, you can do this at home, no problem. No, don't, don't do this. Don't do this at home. We'll, we'll let Esteban do this right now and see how it works. Come on, let's go take a look. Yeah, all right. So I'm gonna take the uh, the hexamethylene diamond that is in water. I'm gonna layer it with some um, Adipic acid in the organic uh, solvent. So we're going to form two layers. And as we get close, you can see the two layers forming. Let's see if we can get you guys in real close and see this reaction. form is a uh, bilayer, organic solvent on top, aqueous solution on the bottom. And after a while, you should see about a millimeter of clear solvent on top of the solvent that has the red food bar. You can see that interface start to form. And it's at the lower bound of that interface where the condensation reaction is going to occur. So in just a minute, this is going to take some tweezers and start pulling at some, it looks like nothing. But out of that interface, that monitor, you're going to get this condensation reaction and the 9166 polymer is going to start forming. So he's just about ready to do that. Some of them are 
or enzymes will go both, both ways depending on concentration. So this is just an example uh, of that kind of thing. Um, so that's the one we're going to look at. And like I said, if you go to the literature, the patent literature in this case, you can find genes, which are multiple genes, which can do all of these various steps in this metabolic pathway. And so something you might want to do is say, well, you know, my metabolic modeling can take me so far. I can kind of try to fix the, the way the flux of various molecules is moving through the system. But eventually, I'm going to want to try the things I have in the lab and see what works the best. And if you try every possible combination of just what I was able to pull out of the literature in a couple of hours, that's something like 16,380 different possibilities. All right? So if, if you do want to explore the space of possibilities, you want to have an efficient way of, of doing that. Part of it is being able to generate all of the protocols or recipes for doing it, which is what we do. And part of it's actually being able to send it someplace and get the stuff made for you. Like just. So in this case, I've listed various genes that, that can be used for each of these uh, steps in the pathway. So now what I'm going to do is go to a live demo. Let's see if this works. So this is this elegant software. So this is like a whiteboard interface. And if you remember the list of genes I had on the other page, that's got the same list of genes here. Behind all of those genes that I sort of sketched out on this whiteboard design interface is an underlying sequence. So I import a GenPank file that has the sequence for that particular piece of DNA. Um, actually going in and let me, let me walk you a little bit around the interface. If you go here, you see a project explorer. I'm going to turn this down a little bit. I'm screeching at you guys. It's this one. Project explorer. And if you move around the explorer, you can um, see the sort of different elements of the interface. You have something that gives you access to a strain library. So you may want to have you know, your, all of your strains that you got in the freezer, that you got cool DNA in, uh, ready and easily accessible to you. You have sequences. These are DNA sequences that you've imported as GenBank files or as they're connected to a database and from which you want to draw pieces of DNA. And then finally, you have a parts database, which are actually sort of sub-components of the DNA, which you see, these are fragments that are interesting to me and things I want to use in a new design. And I've scrolled over different parts of the, of the database interface, and you can see there's a little mini window that pops up so you can kind of get an idea of, oh, well, that's where that DNA comes from. That's the context. Uh, for that DNA. Um, moving further down, you see kind of a usual kind of project tree, you know, keep the projects organized. And here in the genomatic, I have this acidic acid uh, example, which is the one we're going to look at now. So we'll look at the uh, acidic acid design, which is right here. Um, so in a case like this, you see uh, a lot of different components. This kind of hieroglyphics across the top is something called SBOL, synthetic biology object language. It's just kind of a uh, you know agreed upon shorthand for what different functional pieces of DNA, how we just represent them visually on the whiteboard. Uh, under each column, we have the actual DNA. For example, this is a vector backbone. O kind of refers to the origin of replication. If you double click on that, you bring up the a vector editor, a DNA editor essentially, which has that DNA that you're going to be using and puts it in the context of the DNA that you actually physically have as well. Um, similarly with promoters, you could say I want to try a few different promoters and you can double click on that and it'll bring up the, the promoter sequence. So you'll be able to see that as well. Um, on this side of the panel, we have the part inspector. So you have information, metadata about that particular genetic element. You have information here about the collection as a whole, DNA as a whole. And then finally, in this last tab, you have an interface to our server. 
And what this piece is, it says, okay, I've got a design, it's set up, I want to send it out to our server and have you guys tell me how to build this thing. And what it does is it optimizes against direct synthesis, against PCR, do we use Golden Gate, do we use Slick, CPEC, do I use a lot of, you know, of one end ligation, do I, what, what kind of technique do I want to do, send it to the server and have it calculate the protocol for me, the recipe. So in this case, we could just say, um, we'll do a mock assembly, and I'll submit the run to J5, <laughs> and that's because I'm not connected to the internet. So I can't run this down because we're not connected. I don't know what the internet connection is here. But like all good cooking shows, we can go to the result page and just bring up the report. Which I probably can't see either because we're not connected. Demos are great. Live demos. I guess I should have checked to make sure we had any connection. Anyway, let's not do that. Um, let's instead. You have, you have a task board open. What's that? You already have a task board. Go ahead. Okay. There it is. So this is a reports page, and what you can do then now is you can download the results. Okay, what are the results? Well, the results in our case are twofold. You can download a very kind of intense spreadsheet that tells you exactly what you have to do, and you can send that to automation. Or you can download something that's more human readable. Because we have a computer generating a protocol, it makes sense in many cases just to send that to another computer that's attached to automation and have the whole procedure just be automated. So for many of our customers like Genomatic and like Amgen, they want to have sort of a continuous workflow. And since they've got, since they've got the protocol on the computer, just send it to my automation team and, and have it execute. And so that's sort of where things split up. However, it's also nice to have a human readable version because a lot of the things we do are pretty, you know, pretty amenable to the individual researcher and the individual research lab, and they may not need a TCAN to execute this. They just need a nicely formatted protocol. And so we can generate that for them as well. So that's basically how the software works. Um, you whiteboard out a design. We optimize for you synthesis versus PCR various methodologies. And we deliver to you a protocol. It's kind of like a protocol generator. Um, the, the methods that, let's see. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and just here. So, so all of our software is built with this kind of paradigm in mind. We want to allow design build tests, but not ignore the fact that you're going to want to feed results back into your system. So it's not design build tests so much as design build test and evolve. Um, and it's not just sort of like a bunch of you know little balls on a, on a diagram. We actually are building the software according to this workflow. So this is the workflow that we pitched to the National Science Foundation. We've gotten four grants from the NSF to try to instantiate or implement this workflow. The first layer is the design layer. That's getting the, the idea for the molecule out of your head and into the computer. The next layer is the build layer. So generate the instructions and send them to automation. The next layer is test. Get the information back from testing, from sequencing, and get it back into the tool. And finally, the evolve layer. What are you going to learn from that in order to make a better design the next time? Um, that workflow is then in, sort of built into these modules we're creating. And the modules are sort of diagrammed here. Each can act independently, but interact with others through an application program interface, an API, a way that software can talk to other pieces of software. I'm not going to sort of go through all of this in detail, but I'll just sketch out what it is we've built and what it is we're building. So I want to be very clear about what is on the public server right now and you can access, and what is sort of only at Genomatica or Amgen or um, you know, private right now because we haven't made it public. So in order to do that, I'm going to color code this stuff. Um, the design interface, the sequence library stuff, and the protocol generator is all available. You can go on the web and see an account and use it right away. The cost model is the quote engine, the automation engine, the test and measurement engine, design analytics and modeling, the workflow manager is all, it's not vaporware, it's instantiated in some companies, but it's, it's not on the public server. So with this, I'm going to go quickly through these modules and kind of show you what they're supposed to be doing. 
in general, you have, and this little icon here will show you where in that stack we are. So right now we're here at this sort of base level, this workflow manager, that if you have a DNA found, we had a company like Genematic, it's got to keep track of everything that's happening. Processes. So it's kind of like an overarching lens, but only for DNA family. Um, and you can see it kind of makes sense. You have an interface to the customer, interface to automation, interface to sequencing, and you bring knowledge about success or failure back to the customer so they can see what's going on. And work progress reporting, that type of thing. Um, now we're at the top of the stack here, the design editor, and you saw uh, you know, a sort of a live demo of how that works for the Divic Asset example. And that's just basically a whiteboard interface for a building wide DNA library. And it's not just one piece of DNA. Remember, it's combinatorial. So you could have 96, you could have 9,600, you could have very huge libraries generated um, automatically with this software. The vector editor. So this is like Vector NTI, Snapgene, Genius, all of these various vector editors. This is the same kind of thing but it's really built to support the whiteboard interface. It's really built, you know, so you can do all the same functions that you would in traditional vector editors, but it's really designed to support this kind of higher level function. Protein modification, this is not available on the public server, but we want people to be able to look at, at, at the DNA world in two alternative views. You know, if it's something that codes for protein, they should be able to see it as a protein. So if you have structure, if you have information, you should be able to flip a switch and and take a look at what the protein looks like. Of course, there's issues with if you start with a amino acid sequence, you have to do back translation and all that kind of thing. But um, this is a functionality that we have, you know, planned on implementing because we want our users to have that, you know, two different views of the of the world available to them. Um, strain sequence of parts database. You saw this. We keep track of all that for you. <coughs> Protocol generator and optimizer. This is the J5 engine that you know, picks between different alternatives and tells you the right way to build this DNA. Um, currently, J5 uses one of two different topologies. There's many, many protocols published, but they all fall into one of two different topologies. These are the so-called flanking homology methods, like Gibson, CPEC, um, Slice, Seize, or the so-called type 2 endonuclease methods, like Golden Gate and fx -Clone. Both of these um, different topologies are accounted for. Uh, we're also, this is not on the public server, but we're looking into ligase cycling reaction, which is an important uh, methodology if you're doing very, very large amounts of DNA construction. And also user, which is an interesting technique, which kind of extends Golden Gate and allows you to get past the four base pair overhang to something that's a little bit longer and more flexible. So those technologies are very interesting to us in developing around those as well. Finally, there's the cost modeling, but not quite finally, almost finally. There's the cost modeling and ordering. So when we go into a company like Amgen, we want to respect their relationships with their vendors, whether it's Twist or IDT or whatever. So we want to be able to understand, you know, we have hooks into their ordering system so we know, you know, when we do our cost comparisons, what we should be comparing. We want to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Um, the automation engine we've already described. I can take something and you know take it to the bench, put it down, and start my petting. Or because the computer generated protocol, just send it straight down. And we've implemented that at some customer sites as well. This is just a sort of the human readable form. The machine readable form isn't very interesting, but the human readable form looks like this. So this is an automatically generated protocol. It's um, I think this is a Golden Gate protocol. And you see on the right all the various combinations of things you're going to have to put together in order to build your construct library. It's nicely formatted for the user. Test and measurement. So this is something that is not implemented on the public site, but what it allows you to do is to bring sequence data back into the tool and compare it to the sequence you thought you were making. So you know, I wanted to make this DNA, but I got this DNA, and that gets flagged for you as a little red, you know, lights that say, you know, this, this base pair is off. It's not what you wanted. And finally, importantly, because we're building the software as a set of modules that communicate with one another and perform a function, internally into, inside Tisselligent, we're striving to make all those modules communicate through APIs so we can, you know, develop them relatively autonomously. 
what that also allows us to do though is open up the api to other people say hey that's the module i want to use let me let me uh, gain access to your api and the most important api for us to open up the soonest we haven't done it yet apologies is the one to the sort of optimization engine And that's it. So we started with three guys a few years ago. We've grown steadily, um, and we're actually we're actually hiring. You could use full stack developers or bioinformaticians who um, really like biology and coding. Thank you. Nine one six six made a twist. <laughs> Pass that around. Uh, any questions for Mike? And then obviously we won't be offering discounts on his nylon manufacturing plant. <laughs> yeah. Since you mentioned, you know, your 16,000 plus competent tutorial options in that first thing, and since you can keep your parts inventory and your your sort of vector inventory, do you now have the ability to flag interactions between those two? Like this promoter set does not work well in you know this vector or this organism I'm planning to put it in. You know, things that can kind of <coughs> Because that's what narrows down those choices when you have you know, eight or exactly. four Exactly, exactly right. And that's that's the part about capturing test results and feeding it back into the design. And if you if you're if you were watching closely, you saw we had a little NSF symbol by by workflow number one and workflow number two. We don't have an NSF symbol for three and four yet. We're getting three from our customers because you know they're doing test data and stuff. Number four, we're writing grant proposals for that because it's still it's pretty speculative. Not a lot of people have tried this, but there are some people at JBay who are interested in this and so forth. So yeah, you know, we have to kind of balance what our customers are telling us to do to what, as former academics, we kind of want to jump into. So yeah, I hope we get there soon. I have a general question about the end use, the end markets. Uh, you mentioned that there's a lot of sort of therapeutics companies that are beginning to use this technology. Could you comment on a general way, like general yet slash specific ways on what, what, how are they using it to optimize what, do what exactly within, within their within their research or? Yeah. So so um, I don't I don't it's 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 I don't know if it's something that every little bio biotech company will do, but certainly the big ones they basically say we want our own DNA foundries for intellectual property reasons for history I don't know like Amgen. <laughs> They make they make a ton of DNA themselves. They put it together themselves. They have a whole group in Thousand Oaks that's like a reagent group. All they do is, is build reagents for everyone else in Amgen. And so they use our software for a good two to three years just building libraries of parts with Golden Gate overhangs and you know for subsequent assembly to larger parts. And even though they're not building you know metabolic pathways, they're building Big ass, you know, uh -huh. antibodies, and they want to try different things. And you know, it turns out you can actually do mutagenesis with a scheme like this, just by building different parts and stuff. So they have a guy down there who who doesn't have a PhD, but he's like a super cloner. I mean, he just knows everything about cloning. And he, you know, when he heard about this, he just grabbed it, you know, because he knew he could do a lot of stuff with it. So I think I think. And we've seen some other companies too. To first order, they're building libraries of parts that they can use in subsequent rounds of investigation. And that also kind of works with their superiors because they can say, I have now have this library of 100,000 different genetic elements I can play with. So it's not like they're building a de novo library every time. They're building libraries of libraries. Yeah. This looks really powerful. It looks like I can see how you can use it to make combinatorial libraries, but yeah. you select certain designs. I don't want the full factorial. I want a subset. Yes, you can. And I, I kind of glossed over that. I didn't didn't really because I'm not connected to the internet and I didn't have the ability to do a real a real um, demo. But there's a set of rules called Eugene rules which um, that we've incorporated. They've kind of become a standard for kind of like Verilog, you know, how I uh, put different components together and the logic rules about how they go together. So using a few simple Eugene rules, you can cut down the combinatory complexity. For example, the adipate, uh, I, I can't remember if it's the adipate synthesis pathway. Yeah, it's like 16,000. With a very few simple rules, I can cut it down to 96 well plate. That's stuff I want to try. But I didn't have time to really demo that. <coughs> Any you can also build really simple constructs with this. You know, it's interesting because 
Nathan Hilson looked at the profile of people who are using the underlying algorithm J5 to build DNA constructs. And there's this tale of people who are building like big libraries of complex things, mostly Nathan. Um, and, and then there's this, this, this also large group of people who are just, they're building long things, but they're building like one at a time, just like, how do I build a long thing? And so this is really helpful for that. And then there's a, a much bigger group, the biggest group, that are building little things you know, it's like traditional cloning, and just the reason they're doing it is because this is easier. It's a different paradigm. Most cloning tools, like you have to know how you have to know how to clone, and you have to say, okay, I got this is the cut site, you can read. I'm gonna take this thing and make sure it has a compatible, you know, sticky end, and put it in there, all that stuff. This you don't do it. You just say, tell me what you want, tell me the final DNA you want, give me some sources of DNA to work with, and we'll generate the protocol for you. So it's not a traditional cloning tool, but it can be used for traditional cloning. Ish. <laughs> so what, what percent of the people that use this system uh, basically use your automated, where they basically send an order to it with Twist versus those who do it Every, Everyone's doing it themselves, except for some of our big customers, you know, like the Amgens and the Geomaticas. Everyone's doing it by yeah. hand. Yeah. And that's why it's very exciting for us to see Twist developing an API for how I get DNA built. Because now we know a lot about what these guys want, right? right. We're the interface, we've got, we get like in their brain, right? You know, we know what their DNA is, we know what they want to make. And we can, if, if, if Twist has an API for that, we can say, boom, 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 go. You know, just make this, send it through their API, get it delivered the next day. And that's so, the missing piece. So you perceive that it's going to shift towards more of people I would hope so. I mean, I haven't done a lot of cloning, but but you know, I don't love it. I just want to echo your comment too. I hope that is going to be true. Yeah, it I, seems common sense for time, right? Yeah, it's it saves time for for you know a lot of people. Time to market is very important. Like Amgen, Amgen will pay so much money for something. They don't care. They're not very cost sensitive. Oh, we got to get down a penny a base. They don't care if it's a penny a base. They just want it fast. Registry at all, um, which databases are being referenced? Yeah, so, so, so blue and gray. Gray in terms of like it's vaporware, and blue means we have it on the public server. You can do now is you can grab a whole file folder of a thousand sequences and drag it over to our interface, and it'll dump, look, dump it in there. You know, drag and drop works really well. We've got a good parser, just dump all your GenNet files in there. So, right now, you've got to dump it out and dump it in, right? In the future, we want to make a tighter database connection. And, and in our development plan, the first one to connect to would be JVice, because we know those guys. But if you think of another good one, we'll try to connect to that too. But yeah. So on that on that line, what metadata are you carrying over? If I dump in all, you know, grab a swap of GemBank, dump it in, and I'm using it, how much of that information is being carried with each element? So right now, everything that's, that's standard GenBank allowed will come over. But not a bunch of gobbledygook that you, you know, like not not genius, non standard nonsense they've added to the GenBank file. So it has to be a standard GenBank. We're sort of sticking to that, sticking to our guns on that. Now, once you've got data into the system, we're using a very flexible database called MongoDB, which which is very extensible. It's a document based interface. As it, you know, when you build your design, we can add, we can layer on information to that original data very simply without having to worry about database schemas too much. And you know, so um, we're pretty flexible on, on expanding the amount of metadata you have associated with that data. We had to kind of hold the line somewhere. Jetbank files, we drew the line. <coughs> Oxygenation, um, light, 
frequencies and insanity, all these things. How much of that plays into the final equation? Yeah, I think a lot. I mean, for, for a company like um, Genomatica that's going to optimize, I, I would call that strain optimization. You know, you want to be tweaking your strain and finding the sort of external parameters like, you know, growth rates and temperatures and nutrients and, and, and all that stuff which, which really optimizes your growth of your strain if that's what you want to optimize. Um, yeah, that's sort of distinct from what we're doing, but I can see a world in which that data gets fed back into the design and helps you make decisions about what you do in the future. So we're not a metabolic modeling company, and we're not, you know, but we want to play nice. So, so if there that kind of data can fit back into a metabolic model, for example, um, maybe that data can then come back to us. It seems to be a crucial component in the evolution cycle that your design yeah. has. I agree with Pete. Get feedback on how right. much progress you're making towards your goals. Yeah. So, so our idea about that is that it, that, that there's a multi-dimensional space that we're searching. If you take the simplest case, I've got the you know the, the city and county of San Francisco, and it's got a north and a south, you know, north, south, east, west axes, two parameters in which I can search for the highest point in the city. So this the highest the highest point in San Francisco is my fitness measure. I can be very slavish about it, and I can go and check every square centimeter, and find the highest point over by Sucho Towers or something. But there's probably a better way to search that two-dimensional two space, which is by subsampling. And you know, there's some some high stuff over in the financial district. But if I kind of realize it's kind of foamy, right? It has high and low very close. If I go look over in this area, it's more smoothly varying, and I can kind of understand better that this is probably a better global maximum to search, right? So so our idea is that all of those parameters can go into machine learning. All of those things are are ultimately, you know. Influ are influenced by the DNA sequence, right? And so those become those become dependent variables in that independent dependent machine learning exercise. And so I wouldn't reject anything that you have that's good data about the performance of a strain to feed it back into the learning process. I take it all, take it all. Machine learning kind of has to sort out what's useful and what's not. Does that make sense? Sort of. It's a big problem, a big system of focusing on different subsystems is crucial. Uh, yeah, no, it's very, it's very tough. You know, we're not just searching around San Francisco. We're, it's a multi-dimensional space where we're trying to optimize. And some of the variables which we search, some of the parts of the space, are going to be useless. And we'll realize that pretty quickly. I guess if I can paraphrase my point, that an organism is not living in a vacuum that is part that of larger, the larger environment is the other side of the world. I agree. Got to write a grant proposal for that one. Unless Twist wants to fund that. Pleasure. <laughs> 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 Do we see one more question in the back? Sure. Uh, you mentioned metabolic model. Can you incorporate any sort of information from metabolic models? Yeah, I, I, I'm a physicist by training, and I don't know jack shit about metabolic modeling. So whatever, whatever we can get from the metabolic modelers that is good information for us, you know, we'll build APIs to the models, whatever. But um, at least for our company, we're kind of focused on after you've given us the best possible idea about what to build, how can we build it for you? And build a lot of it so you can kind of search that space. Is there any mechanism for translation of learning from one client to another, though? Or is it all kind of, you know, you've got one silo for what one client has learned from their, you know, evolution experiments? And then well, you've that, got that, that kind of speaks to, you know, what our use agreement is with our users. So all of our public users have a relationship with us, basically. We don't see their data. We don't care what they're building. But we can look at success or failure so we can build better algorithms. Um, and with private customers and corporations, it's a little bit it's a little bit tighter. We can't really use everything they do. A lot of times, we have to install our entire software package behind their firewall, like a downloaded piece of software. They don't want to go out. They don't want Amazon Web Services to be hosting their, their stuff. Someday they will. Right now, they're, they're parents. So, um, so yeah. So we, we have a, there's there's limitations on what we can learn from some customers. Give it a time, just like to join me and thank you, Mike, again for a really interesting thank you. Thank you.
hope you'll be available for questions. I'm sure we'll be glass of wine for the next few months. So thanks again.